Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's um, webcast, uh, which is going to be on the Affordable uh, Care Act's impact on self-funded employers in medical tourism. Um, I'm Jonathan Adelhite, the CEO of BMTA. So I see a lot of good friends and colleagues on this webcast from here in the U.S. and all over the world, but I see some new people too, so thank you for joining. Um, for those of you who have been, uh, many of you have been following this issue for uh, a while with me, and for those of you who are new, I've been covering this since 2010. Um, you know, the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the ACA or Obamacare, um, its impact on self-funded medical plans in the U.S., but also on medical tourism. And when we look at medical tourism, we're looking at domestic medical tourism, international medical tourism, inbound and outbound, and, and what is that impact? Um, and the interesting thing is, I think it, 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 it's kind of amazing, there's still a lot of misinformation um, out there or misperception of it. Um, we knew what the impact would be before the law was even passed, and nothing has really changed since then. Um, uh, and, and the reality is, for um, you know, outbound medical tourism, Americans leaving the U.S., there's a very positive impact. Um, there's a very positive impact for domestic medical tourism, you know, in Americans traveling within the U.S. for healthcare, and for inbound medical tourism, um, international uh, uh, citizens coming into the U.S. for healthcare, there is no um, there is no impact whatsoever, meaning it, it kind of stays neutral. So, so overall, medical tourism has a very uh, is very positively impacted um, by the health care reform law. We've been kind of covering this for about, um, you know, since 2010. Um, the health care reform law doesn't have a significant uh, impact on lowering costs at all. Um, what we've actually, uh, you know, seen is that it's, um, it's driven costs up quite substantially. And there was a lot of talk about when healthcare reform was being passed, that it was going to reduce healthcare costs. But if you actually looked at the law beforehand and you look where healthcare costs were going and what the law actually reformed, you found that it actually didn't do anything to impact the lowering of healthcare costs. Um, you know, if we just look at the healthcare spending from 1980 to 2012, all over the world has been increasing, but you can see here in the U.S the impact is the greatest. You know, it's skyrocketing in the U.S. significantly more than any other country, and the only other country that, that will still far away but close is um, Switzerland. Um, and there, these costs are not changing. You're going to see no downward, downward impact or leveling off because of um, uh, health care reform. For uh, people who aren't from the U.S. or are used to having government insurance um, and public plans, it doesn't create a public plan. Um, it's still a private insurance industry with, um, uh, with health care exchanges. Um, you know, there were some very positive things and negative things within the law at the same time. Um, what you know, a positive thing was the waiving of pre-existing condition clauses, saying if you're sick, you can't be denied coverage. You have to actually, um, you, 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 they have to accept you and give you coverage. And if you're sick, um, the insurance companies have to charge you the same amount that they would a healthy person. So very, very potentially fair for people who are sick and have health conditions because a lot of them before either were pre ex which means the insurance company could say for several years, we're not going to cover your cancer or your diabetes, or they could say depending on your plan for your life. Um, it eliminated annual and lifetime limits, where before you had plans um, with a million dollars annual or lifetime limits. We, we started to see some in self-funded plans at a quarter of a million dollars. Very low, uh, low annual lifetime limit. So it said now there is none. So you know, if you spend five, ten million dollars on your 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 healthcare condition, you know, cancer transplant, um, there's no cap on it. So if you basically say, you know, it's just common sense. If you tell people, you know, we're eliminating caps on your insurance, you can spend unlimited amounts on your on your healthcare. Um, anyone who's sick now can get coverage right away, and it's the same price as a healthy person, and I think that common sense dictates that prices have to go up. You know, it's like if you went to go buy a car and you went to get the bottom of the line car versus the top of the line car that has the leather interior, the top navigation, rear view cameras, um, auto parking, all these cool functions, 
that, but that car is going to cost a lot more than the base function. But when healthcare reform was being passed, um, I would say there was a lot of wool pulled over everyone's eyes saying, hey, this is going to bring costs down because if we get everyone in who buys insurance and spreads the risk, and we have a very diverse group of young, middle-aged people, old people, sick, healthy, that cost will level off. But the reality is the healthy people, a lot of them, have not gotten insurance, or the young people, or more have dropped off of that insurance because they said, wait a minute, if young people have to pay the same price as old people and healthy people pay the same as sick people, how do you get there? How do you get there in cost? And once again, that's very common sense, and we predicted this before the law was passed, the older and the sick people's premiums come down and the younger and healthier people's premiums go up. So they have an increased price. So the people who are younger and healthier say, why should I pay for health insurance? And be honest, if I can come in at any time and buy health insurance. So they put off buying health insurance. And then interestingly enough, there was um, no real penalty um, or disincentive to be healthy, or we say there's no incentive, I'm sorry, no incentive to be healthy. Because what the law basically did is that if, if Joe goes eat fast food every day, goes to McDonald's, and eats breakfast, lunch, and dinner at McDonald's, drinks a bottle of liquor, vodka per day, smokes two packs of cigarettes, and then he's standing next to Jane, who eats nothing but health foods, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, exercises twice per day, is extremely healthy and fit. They have to pay the same health insurance premiums, no matter what. So for the healthy person, what they're also seeing is that they're subsidizing people who live unhealthy lifestyles. So it's, there's some definite um, unfair elements to the law that weren't really thought out very well. Um, and, uh, and also the, what the law basically said is we, we are going to um, make and bring everyone into the health insurance pool so we can spread the risk. And we're going to do that by providing penalties for people who don't buy insurance. And the penalty for the first year for individuals was $95 which is about $8.33 per month. And when we go into what the cost of health insurance, if you have to buy it, it was meaningless. It, it was almost a joke um, to go ahead and tell people, uh, you, you know, if you don't feel you need health insurance right now, and we know you can buy it whenever you need it with no penalty, um, you know, if you don't spend, spend thousands of dollars on your health insurance per year, we're going to fine you almost $9 a month it's a no-brainer. The people will say, well, find me the $9 a month, and I'll just buy insurance when I need it. Um, so not much of the law was very well thought of. You had some of the politicians when they were passing it saying they'll read it after it's passed. Um, and, you know, even even one, one simple thing, um, w which we'll probably go into a little bit later if we have time, the Cadillac tax. You know, the Cadillac tax for me was the biggest sign of how no one really thought out this law. Um, and, and no one ever did any real research or math. So, so one of the fascinating things for me was it took like several years before Fox News and CNN and all the other media outlets started covering what we were covering in 2010 when the law was being passed. So when the law was being passed, we were doing webcasts on exactly how much costs were going up, what were the negatives of the law, what were the positives, and a lot of the things that we covered, it literally took two to three years for all these major news networks to cover, and then they covered it as if it was some kind of surprise or new news. Um, and I think, I don't know if it's because no one wanted to delve into this issue, um, or it was just the sensationalism at the moment um, uh, that was going on, but all these things were known before the law was ever passed. So with the Cadillac tax, you know, for those of you from the U.S. insurance industry, you're very familiar with it, which, which kicks in in just a few years. It basically says if you're paying more than a certain amount as an individual for health insurance annually or a certain amount for a family annually, then we're going to determine that you have a Cadillac plan, meaning a really rich luxury plan, therefore you must be rich, and we're going to hit you with a 40% tax. And the beauty of it is when the law was being passed, in, in probably 30 seconds, I sat at my desk with a calculator and a paper and pen, and I calculated the inflation rate of health insurance um, back then and doing it each year. So like if it was, I forget what it was then, let's say 5 to 6%, taking the cost for the 
individual to family times 5 to 6 percent in what it was going to cost in 2011, 5 to 6 percent to 2012 and so forth, all the way to when the Cadillac tax remains in effect. And the beauty of it is it was like 80 percent of Americans fall, would fall under the, the Cadillac tax, saying that they had rich plans, and then they'd be hit with a 40 percent tax on top of that. So right now, most people can't afford the health insurance now. There's a huge crisis going on. Costs keep significantly increasing. I'm getting hit with my own plan between 20 to 40 percent per year, and I never even really use it. And to say in just a couple of years, we're going to increase it by another 40 percent, I mean, that could mean a collapse of our health insurance system if, uh, you know, if uh, something isn't done. But all these things, like that took me 30 seconds to do, um, all these things were known when the law was being passed. And this is just an example of, you know, in 2014, the average family cost of insurance was estimated by Kaiser to be about $17,000 a year. And it's just getting to the point where it's unsustainable for individuals and families to cover that. And the deductibles are going um, uh, up later. and, and the, I'm going to tell you some secrets of what's going on with um, rate increases and insurance costs going up and the games being played with deductibles. Because right now, this is um, what I was saying about the games being played in 2010 about people not sharing things. People are playing games with the statistics right now. And it's going to come out, whether it's this year or the next year. And, and, and I think it's um, when I share that with you, and, and feel free to text me a message if for some reason I forget the presentation uh, towards the end, how those deductible games are being played. So this is a chart right here by Kaiser of showing the cost and increase of health insurance premiums, employees' contributions to the premiums, employees' earnings, and overall inflation. So you can see since 1999 all the way to 2014, there's been a massive increase um, you know, in, in the cost of care, where you know, you're seeing a 212% increase in workers' um, uh, workers' contribution and 191% increase in health insurance premiums. And then if you go down to the bottom chart, this is workers' earnings, this light blue. And you can see it, it really hasn't increased. You know, it's up 54% since 1999 to 2014. Um, but we're talking about the, the rate of increase in insurance premiums is four times greater um, than the, the salaries and the employees' earnings that they're making. So it's not even keeping up. Um, and this chart is the average annual single and family premiums. I wish I'd made it a little bit bigger for you. But you can see in 1999, single coverage um, you know, was almost $2,000 and family was close to $6,000. And then you fast forward until today, and single coverage is almost $6,000 and family coverage is almost $17,000. So it has gone up three times. So you can imagine how it's going to keep increasing and increasing and increasing. Um, and it's not going to go down. This is an example uh, on a different chart just showing you small employers versus large employers. So the dark um, blue is employers under 200. Um, and then the, lar the light blue is employers that have over 200 or more employees. And you can see you know, the costs are very similar. There's no real big difference if you're a large employer or a small employer. Um, but the costs and the premiums are continuing to, to increase. Um, so, uh, you know, the one thing we're seeing now is what we call adverse selection in the insurance industry. And that means that um, I was telling you how the healthy people and the young people said, that, hey, man, why should I subsidize sick and older people? So they've dropped off the health insurance um, to come back when they want it. So you have adverse selection, which means more sick people um, and more older people on the plan. Um, employers over 50 lives were required to uh, implement um, health care reform and, uh, and uh, offer health insurance um, and pay for it for their employees. And if they did it, they would get hit with a $2,000 fine. And then uh, a lot of that was postponed. Um, uh, uh, large businesses had to, have had to do it already. And then um, businesses with 51 or more employees have to do it this coming year. A lot of big employers you know, publicly came out back in 2014 talking about how this is really going to increase their expenses. You know, Delta said it would increase it by $100 million for health insurance. Um, so it has a huge impact. And this is just a copy of the letter that Delta sent, um, you know, uh, uh, in relation to the cost of health insurance. So um, one of the things is everyone calls it health care reform. It's really health insurance reform. You know, it, you know, we already talked about waiving the pre-act, elimination of lifetime 
uh, limits. It allows you know, children to stay on the plan until age 26. For individual insurance, it said insurance companies can only make 20% um, profit in admin fees, and the 80% of that has to go towards medical claims. And for groups, employers, it said they can you know, take 15% for profit in admin and give 85% to medical claims. Here's the other beauty of it, everyone, is in 2010, with that same calculation I did for the medical tax, uh, the medical, I'm sorry, the Cadillac tax that we were talking about, guess what I figured out? I figured out that by 2018 and definitely around 2020, how that cap that they're putting on the insurance companies for their profits and admin, it would actually be greater than it is today without a cap. And what that means is that um, and, and this is why I think for a lot of this, it's, you know, I, you know I, I think some of it was intended. There was some tremendous lobbying by the insurance companies, by pharma, by medical supplies to get this law passed. It meant that the insurance companies in 2010 had no cap on what they could keep for profits. And by 2018 and 2020, the cost of insurance are going to be so significantly more that that 15 and 20 percent equals more profits than they were making in 2010, and still no one has talked about that in the media yet. Of course, who advertises on all the major news networks, pharmaceutical companies, medical supply companies, and insurance companies? Um, so it's not in the best interest of the news networks to really cover this stuff. Um, also, uh, when we uh, look at that, is the pharmaceutical industry um, cut a deal with the Obama administration where they would support the law, and the same thing with the medical supply and equipment company they would support the law as long as they, um, they did not regulate pharmaceutical or medical supplier or equipment companies. Um, and the law got passed. And now what are we seeing? If you have um, hepatitis C, which is going to have the biggest impact to self-funded employers and insurance companies over the next two to three years, billions of dollars in impact. The Sovaldi drug, you know, can cost anywhere from $90,000 to $180,000 to cure hepatitis C. It's one of the first drugs out there to cure a disease. Um, otherwise, these people eventually need liver transplants. Um, and there's been a lot of controversy because no one can regulate the fees of what they're charging. So in the American market, you're paying $90,000 to $180,000 for this cure for hepatitis C, where the price is totally different in other countries. And because it's so expensive, a lot of insurance companies are not giving it to people right away. They're, they're setting a standard and say, you need to be this sick with your liver, you know, and closer to a transplant before we give you this cure. And if you have a disease that's killing your liver and you're going to give a transplant, there's a cure out there, you want it now. So, you know, I understand how unfair that is. So, guess how much Sovaldi is being sold in Egypt or Brazil for? $900. The same drug that's being, you know, sold from anywhere from $60,000 to seventy to $90,000 in the U.S., $900 in Egypt, in Brazil, in India, in these other countries. Um, and why is that being allowed? And we're starting to see people and employers look to implement and send their employees abroad for this hepatitis C treatment for Savaldi or Harvoni, but it's because of the health care reform law being passed and the agreements work up. Um, so, you know, this is, and this is to give you an example of how health care costs are coming down. The pharmaceutical companies, the medical supplies, they won, and now they can charge whatever they want. And if you're really in touch with self-funded plans, you know, the future, one of the biggest expenses is going to be specialty biologic drugs personalized medicine, a very expensive drugs that have, you know, big impacts on, you know, specific diseases. Um, so another thing not, well, it really is tied to health care reform. No, one, no one's saying that. Um, but there wasn't a lot of competition in the U.S. health insurance marketplace. You know, you had five major insurance companies, um, and, you know, they all competed against each other. Well, now Aetna um, is buying Humana for $37 billion. So that is two of the biggest insurance companies merging, so less competition. And then Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield um, announced it's purchasing Cigna, you know. So now you have, you know, a merger where you're going to have half, the, almost half the competition there was 
in the health insurance marketplace than before. And a lot of this is they need to consolidate because of all the rules and compliance with health care reform. And less competition means, less, you know, you know, if, if we know it's in any product or service that's out there, I mean, prices are going to go up. Um, and it's a, what it means to me is you don't hear anyone out there talking about how the Affordable Air Care Act has had an impact on these mergers and how it's going to drive prices down. Um, I'm sorry, drive, drive prices up. No one's, no one's talking about it at all. So the reality is if healthcare reform doesn't lower pharmaceutical, medical supply, medical equipment, if it doesn't actually lower health insurance costs and costs are already unsustainable, then what, what solution is there out there for U.S. employers? Um, there really is none. You know, I'm heavily engaged in, you know, uh, health care reform. We do a lot of health care reform training around the country, a lot of corporate wellness training and education. <laughs> the only other thing out there is corporate wellness, you know, trying to get your employees to engage in healthy behavior, to have a long-term impact on cost and prevent care, but it takes several years to implement a corporate wellness program and to start seeing ROI. So if for employers who want um, savings now or to have an impact, well, what do you do? Um, they, you know, they've tried chips and high deductibles, they've tried consumer-driven plans, none of these things lower health care costs. So one of the only things they're going to be able to do is implement domestic and international medical tourism as a way to lower their costs and have instant guaranteed savings. And for the employers that are doing it, they're seeing the positive results of it. Now before I go into a little bit about self-funding and medical tourism, I want to tell you the game that's being played in the media and with, with, with our government regarding the Affordable Care Act. So people are talking about, well, health insurance premiums are only going up 4 to 5 percent. We're not seeing the big increases that we really expected of 10, 15, 20 percent. Why is that? What, why it is is that all the employers are moving towards high deductible plans. So. If someone had a $2,000 deductible before, and they have to, to pay that out of their own pocket before they have health insurance, and now they have a five or $10,000 deductible, what happens? It's a, it's a shifting of the cost. So the employer moves to a high deductible plan, where now we shifted the cost to the employee, there's a less of a rate increase on health insurance, but now someone's got to pay five to $10,000 out of pocket. And so the insurance company doesn't have to raise their rates as much because there's that high deductible plan. And that's what's happening, and it's a game being played where people are acting like, oh, insurance premiums aren't going up as bad as we thought they were, and that's because we're shifting everything to the burden of the employee. And what's happening is that employee now has a five or $10,000 deductible, and they're saying, I'm going to avoid health, access to health care. I'm not going to go to the emergency room. Um, I'm not going to go to the doctor. I'm not going to get my medication. Common sense dictates that is a disaster waiting to happen. What that means is that that employee is going to wait until things get to a catastrophic level, and then there's going to be a major claim for them. And then they're not going to be able to cover the deductible, but the employers and the insurance companies are going to get hit with larger catastrophic conditions because employees are putting off their health care. So there is no magic solution happening in the U.S. health insurance industry, and things are just getting worse. Um, so when we look at self-funding, um, and I want to kind of go into some of the key buyers uh, of health care here in the U.S. and self-funding, is, is, is after health, when health care reform was being passed, we were out there talking about this is going to be a boom for health care, for self-funding. So there's going to be more self-funded employers than before. You had some, some people out there that didn't know anything that were out telling people, oh, I've read the health care reform law, and, you know, self-funding is going to die. And it's because, you know, you got a lot of people out there that talk about health care reform. They have no idea what they're talking about, and they just spread a lot of misinformation. So, um, you know, uh, there's now more self-funded employers than before. You know, in 2013, 61% of covered U.S. workers were self-funded. 83% uh, offered some kind of self-funded plan. But, you know, a lot of people don't talk about, you know, um, and this is just some logos of some big self-funded employers, is employers with over 5,000 employees, 95% of them are self-funded, 95%. So most employers are self-funded, and that's where an employer covers the cost of their own health care. They don't go to an insurance company using their own money to pay claims, and they typically hire a TPA, a third-party administrator, to implement it. Um, and then, you know, some of them work with the big insurance companies to rent their medical networks like Aetna and United Healthcare and Sigma and Blue Cross to administer their, uh, 
self-funded plans, but then you've got the fully insured plans too, where they just pay the um, the insurance company and avoid the risk. And then you've got the brokers and insurance agents who play a really critical role in advising employers on their health insurance. And, and one of, I think, the really sad parts of uh, health care reform was um, everyone used insurance brokers and agents as scapegoats. And they pretended like these are the guys that are the reason why health insurance costs are going up. And, and they put in laws to create transparency for the commissions that they're providing. And a lot of the insurance companies made moves to eliminate their commissions. And, and, and they play a very important role, not only helping the employer in, in their decision-making process, but going and doing open enrollment meetings and educating the employees on site about their new benefits. And so brokers and agents are really critical in this process as I go into later a little bit about them on the medical tourism side, because you need an advocate on site educating and talking to the employers and educating and talking to the employees and getting them to implement it. And then you've got big consulting firms um, that are slightly different than insurance agents. Insurance agents get commissions, consulting uh, firms get paid uh, monthly consulting fees like the Aons, the Mercers, the Marshes, the Willis. Um, so uh, I already, you know, kind of gave a little bit overview of self-funded medical plans it's where, you know, the employer takes their own cash, pays their own medical bills, and then you've got the fully insured plans where you know you're just paying a set premium. Well, the advantage with a self-funded plan um, <clears throat> is you don't need to set aside uh, reserves or premium taxes or some of the other things that the insurance companies have to do. But the best part is the savings go in your pocket. Um, if you're paying a million dollars a year to Blue Cross Blue Shield, for your fully insured premium, and your claims and admin are only $700,000 a year, if you have $300,000 in savings, that goes in the employer's pocket. They get to keep it. Um, so for an employer, you just think about if they want instant cash savings to reduce the cost of their health insurance plan, what can they implement that could do that? Well, if you get an employee to travel from Atlanta to California, and the cost of that care is 50% less, that 50% of savings goes in the employer's pocket. If you get that employer to send that employee to Costa Rica or Puerto Rico or to Germany, and that savings is 50%, that money goes in the employer's pocket. So for the employer, it's a win-win if their employees go overseas. And you know, one thing is when, when employers implement medical tourism in a self-funded plan, it's, um, you know, it's voluntary. You know, it's, it's, uh, no one's required to go overseas for care, um, but they incentivize. So um, what, what's interesting is um, in 2004 and 5, I was the first one to implement medical tourism in self-funded and fully insured plans. Um, you know, worked with all the, all the uh, media uh, news outlets, Time Magazine, Newsweek, USA Today, to really cover stories of what we were doing as cutting edge. And what we did is we incentivized employees who waived deductible, waived co-insurance, so employees saved thousands of dollars, gave them money, um, you know, cut them a check, uh, paid for their airfare at hotel, and it was a very successful program. Interestingly enough, some of the first um, people who came on the scene, facilitators, insurance companies, and so forth, to try to implement medical tourism, they actually decided we shouldn't give incentives. And we shouldn't cover airfare, you know, hotels. It, you know, and I, I have no idea why they thought this way. Um, but an example of that would be like Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, which implemented medical tourism. So they had no incentives for the first couple of years. So it was actually more expensive for their members to go abroad for medical tourism than to stay locally in South Carolina. I want you to think about that because if they go in South Carolina, they pay their normal deductible and co-insurance, but if they go overseas. They're still paying deductible insurance, they're paying for airfare, they're paying for a hotel, out-of-pocket expenses. So that's a no-brainer. So for several years, they had no one travel overseas, and they didn't know why. Um, so that's been, been an issue. Um, another big issue that's been really missing from the industry is education and engagement. So everyone is approaching the U.S. market with this philosophy of, I'm going to offer you as a self-funded employer or an insurance company medical tourism, uh, I'm going to offer it to you for free. I've got a beautiful brochure. I've got a beautiful website. Send me patients. Send me your patients. And it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. No one's going to hop on a plane and go to another country or another destination for care if they don't believe in the quality of the doctors, the hospitals, you haven't built up health care trust, um, and you haven't engaged. Um, a lot of the hospitals you know, want to target U.S. employers, 
but they never come and they don't meet them in person. They don't meet the brokers. They don't meet any of the key players. And, and that's first off. If you, if you don't meet these people in person and build a relationship, you're never going to do business with them. And, and if you're an employer, and I know we've got a lot of big employers on this call, people from the insurance industry, don't work with hospitals that don't want to take the effort to come meet you and build a relationship with you. Um, you know, you, you've got to be more um, than a number, and you need to go see those facilities um, because that's going to make you feel a lot more comfortable and go meet those doctors and touch and feel it. But after you do, how do you educate and engage and get the message to your employees um, so that uh, they understand what, what, what there is to offer and they actually utilize the benefit? And I think mean, one of the key things I talk about in the industry is that utilization because there can be very low utilization because no one's getting to the employees. So, you know, no one's actually going out on site. They're not doing enrollment meetings. They're not doing payroll covers. And, and, and it's very high level. Here's the brochure. Here's the pretty website. Make your decision. So there's some really innovative solutions you can do for that um, on, on the uh, medical tourism side and self-funding. You know, there's one company out there called Health Flights that will be at our conference uh, in, in about a week or so in Orlando that's working with a lot of self-funded employers specifically on the engagement and education side. That's one of you know, the big, my, um, I would say, big pet projects that I've been very passionate about for the industry because it's not just for Americans going abroad or Americans going domestically for care. It's for anywhere. You know, it could be a, a Saudi patient going to, to Germany or Switzerland for care, a Chinese patient going to London for care. There's a total lack of this education engagement at a really deep dive level. Um, and, and this is the reason why a lot of hospitals aren't getting more patients or if an employer and insurance company implements it and they don't see dual utilization, they don't get it. I was on the phone a couple uh, months ago with one of the biggest health insurance companies in the country that we helped implement medical tourism years ago. And um, one of the, it was a person in a specific division in their pharmaceutical benefits management division, their pharmacy for self-funded plans for this big insurance company, and they said to me, oh, yeah, you know, I know we as an insurance company, we implemented medical tourism, um, you know, about two years ago. But, you know, it, it's not a, it, you know, it doesn't seem like it's a benefit that anyone's really interested in. We really don't get a lot of people who end up using it. And I said, do you know, do you know why that is? And she goes, no, I don't know a lot about our program. Well, hey, that's a good sign right there if you're working for the care and you don't know. But I said, that's because you guys have done zero education and engagement, zero, and no one knows it even exists. Um, so the insurance agent to rep rep represent this carrier, if, if I talk to them, they'll say, yeah, I heard this carrier has this benefit, but I don't really know anything about it. And this is the crazy disconnect I see in the industry. I mean, where the insurance company is sitting here and saying, I don't understand why no one's traveling. No one must care or like this medical travel benefit but it's actually the carrier's fault because they have done nothing. They don't understand the benefit, and they're not educating and engaging. So it's, it's a big issue where if you're an employer or you're an insurance agent, you have to focus on this element very significantly. And, and a lot of the people just aren't, you know, they're not going to do it right. And then you have to be very careful because one dirty secret in the industry is that almost everyone is violating HIPAA. And so everyone pretends they have to have a compliance solution but they're transferring medical records through Outlook email. They're managing everything through Microsoft and Excel. It's very disorganized. And for those of you who are saying, oh, that must be just the international hospitals. But if I'm doing domestic medical tourism with top centers of excellence in the U.S., that's not happening wrong. But pretty much almost all of the U.S. hospitals who are doing domestic medical travel and centers of excellence, they have no systems in place to manage it. Um, so there are solutions out there, but you have to go and find them. Um, in fact, it's funny because one of their, um, there's a really big business group on health that's implemented domestic medical travel and centers of excellence, and I had a call with them, um, you know, and talked to them, and they acted like, um, you know, they had this amazing solution, and you realize they really didn't understand medical travel that much. They understood it at a very 10,000-foot uh, level, but not in a deep dive about what needs to make it work. And when I started asking them, how do you educate, how do you engage, what technology are you using, and you know, all these different questions, what I found is there's nothing. There's really nothing in place. Um, so you, you really, you know, this is a benefit that works, and 
you just don't you just don't throw it out there and, and, and hope it works. So to give you an example, you know, one company that, that's done really successful, Hickory Springs manufacturing company, HSM, you know, they implemented medical tourism years ago. They saved uh, over $10 million over five years. We worked with Diane Sturger and Nightline a couple of years ago to put that story together. They were sending patients to India. Now they're going to Costa Rica and soon Puerto Rico, but saving significant amounts of money, waiving deductibles and co-insurance for their employees, paying for travel, airfare, hotel for the patient and a loved one. And the best part is change the entire corporate culture where now the employees actually prefer to travel for medical tourism than to get it domestically. And you know, that is, is the best. And that took a while. That took almost two, I think several years to get that employer to go on record. And it was only because they had a top executive who turned over, a new executive came in and said, you know what, you know, I, you know, I know this is a topic we don't necessarily really want to talk about out there, um, but it's important, you know, healthcare needs to reform and we want to share with people how successful this program is. So a lot of the employers who are doing it, they're doing it very quietly, um, you know, and they're not going public because they don't want a backlash in the local community. Um, so, and then you've got, you know, you've got the international medical tourism where you can send patients abroad, um, save up to 90% on here, and you can send them anywhere in the world, you know, from the U.S. market, you know, Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, um, uh, you can save a significant amount of money. And uh, the benefits and the quality of healthcare is amazing. You've got to work with the right hospitals, though. You've got to make sure they have an international patient department. A great example is Puerto Rico. We just worked with the government of Puerto Rico on a multi-year project to come in and certify all their hospitals, their hotels, their clinics, the government officials, taxi drivers, everyone who touches a patient so that they have amazing outcomes and care. And this was done because they wanted to, to nail the patient experience. And that's one of the biggest parts about medical tourism is the patient has an amazing experience. They go out and they tell everybody that they know and more patients travel. So Puerto Rico, I think you're going to see emerge as one of the really top leaders in medical tourism to the U.S. market, and they're investing a lot to penetrate the U.S. market. A, a big key going in here regarding if you're, you know, an international hospital on the call is everything is based about the relationships. You know, what we see is we see the ebb and cycle in this industry where you have hospitals target U.S. employers, and they'll get clients. And then what will happen is over time, they'll start losing their clients. And it's because they stop engaging with the marketplace. They stop coming to meet those brokers, those employers, those insurance companies. And then a huge emerging trend here in the U.S. is domestic medical tourism, which is like employers like Pepsi working with Johns Hopkins, um, Lowe's hardware stores working with Cleveland Clinic saying, hey, we have a huge variability in cost, pricing, and quality. So our employees, if we let them choose their hospitals on their own, um, you know, we'll have ones that, you know, give a heart procedure, cost 100000 at the Cleveland Clinic, one of the best hospitals, and they have the best outcomes. They find, they'll have an employee go to a hospital in Miami and pay 150000 for a heart procedure with worse quality, more complications, and, and worse outcomes, and then they'll have someone get it for 60000 in Kansas, and they realize the pricing's all over the place, and the quality's all over the place. If we can waive deductible and co-insurance and pay for travel expenses, and get them to go to a couple top facilities within our Centers of Excellence Network, we're going to be able to budget for costs, actually lower our costs because there's going to be less complications, employees will be back to work faster. Um, and this is going to be great for employees too because they'll save on all their out-of-pocket out expenses. So it's been a huge win for big U.S. employers, a Center of Excellence domestic model. There's just a lack of education to the plan members and a lack of engagement. Um, and so, uh, you know, where healthcare reform is going is going to be a huge, you know, it's going to really help put some rocket fuel behind medical tourism um, just because of those rising health insurance costs, the Cadillac tax coming up very shortly, and employers need to be doing something very um, instant. Um, and we're working with a lot of large brokerage firms and employee benefits consultant firms to implement medical tourism domestically and international with their plans. You're going to see in the new year some more stories that will probably be public that will be willing to go into the media news. Um, you're going to see a lot that implement it, but they're going to be very quiet about it and not out publicly sharing what they're doing. Um, you know, I invite you all to come to our World Medical Tourism Global Healthcare Congress, which is uh, just about starts, I think, 10, 11 days from now, September 27th through the 30th in Orlando. Um, we really, it's going to be amazing. It's integrated with the Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress 
which is the largest U.S. insurance con conference for self-funded employers. Um, they're both conferences are integrated. We have integrated sessions, integrated exhibit halls. Um, you know, we're expecting over 2,500 attendees this year. It's going to be record, record attendance. But we have the sessions on how do you implement medical tourism in self-funded and, um, and uh, domestic plans. Um, uh, we're going to have a lot of topics on medical tourism. We're going to have a lot of topics on health care reform. And then we have uh, networking software where you can connect and network with uh, the attendees at the conference, whether they're insurance companies, employers, hospitals, self-funded employers. So if you're a self-funded employer, you get to meet with the hospitals and the facilitators that are doing medical tourism. Um, it, it's a very high energy event. We, we, when we started it in 2008, it's the only global event of its kind where it's focused on high level education and thought leadership, but people meeting each other. So you'll find that people are very open to connecting, network, and meeting. This is an example of the type of employers from the U.S. cell phone side we see that we get at our event, all the large employers from all across the country. We get a lot of multinational employers. We bring in ministers of health from all over the world, the Caribbean, the Middle East, for our um, ministerial summit. These are some of the sponsors um, on the U.S. insurance side, some of the big players. Um, these are some testimonials from some of the big sponsors and attendees before. Uh, but it's an event that really is uh, unlike anything that's out there. Um, we, uh, for those of you that are on the webcast that haven't registered and still like to attend, we're just offering a special offer just for today. If you register, it's EV Extend. Um, is the actual code that you can use on our website. You'll save $1,000 on registration, so it'll be $1,500. Um, so if you want to use that, use that today. The website is medicaltourismcongress.com. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of events all over the world. We have a big Asia-Pacific event we're doing in China in November. Um, so there's a lot of other conferences or workshops we're hosting that you can participate in. If you're a self-funded employer or a broker looking to implement medical tourism, reach out and you know, we're happy to help you and um, implement uh, that process. If you're not part of our LinkedIn community, um, please join. Um, we're the biggest social media influencer with HR, insurance, and healthcare in the world. We run about 30 groups with about 750,000 members. Um, you know, whether it's we run the biggest group on healthcare reform and Obamacare online, I think we've got like 40, 45,000 members in that on LinkedIn. Um, we run the big medical tourism group with about 9,000, the big HR group with about 250,000. We're constantly updating and providing news and info. We run the big benefits executive group with uh, self-funded employers with about 33,000 members on LinkedIn to join. Join it. I hope to see you um, at our conference in a couple, uh, in almost a week in Orlando. It's, we're going to have uh, some really cool stuff happening this year, a lot of energy. Um, in the exhibit hall, the exhibit hall is really expanded. We're actually going to have elephants, alligators. We're giving away $150,000 in wearables, and we're going to have some wearables challenge. We got one sponsor bringing a money machine that blows money, and one person is going to get to win up to $10,000. Um, you know, it's just really cool atmosphere, uh, really great for connections and education. Um, for those of you that really want to get educated in medical tourism, on Wednesday at the conference, you can go through our workshop and become a certified medical tourism professional. Um, and for those of you that actually want to become educated in healthcare reform, we have a workshop where you can become a certified healthcare reform specialist at the conference. So you just got to reach out um, and talk to us about it. If um, anyone has any questions, um, you know, they can feel free to email me personally or call me. Um, one person asked, or are you going to get a copy of the slides? So we are going to make um, the slides uh, available. Um, uh, on um, Afterwards, we're going to email them out to you. And right now, I'm just looking to see about any of the other questions um, that came in. And if any of you have any um, specific questions about the Affordable Care Act, I'm happy to share them. I had to do kind of a very high overview. So I wasn't really able to delve into a lot of the different issues of, um, you know, of, of the employer mandates, the individual mandates how insurance premiums could vary, those type of things. I tried to put it in a real high level so you got the, the concept of it. Um, and uh, let's see, any other questions? Um, one question asked, do you have any real numbers of U.S. medical tourists traveling to other countries? Um, so the reality is there's no official numbers. Um, it, you know, if anyone's telling you this is how many numbers of Americans travel overseas, it's not, it's not true. So we're trying to do a lot of research, a lot of education through the International Healthcare Research Center. 
on medical tourism and the number of uh, medical tourists traveling. So, you know, one, one study showed there were just a million Mexican-Americans doing cross-border health back into Mexico each year. You know, we estimate there's probably, you know, anywhere between one and two million medical tourists who travel per year. But unfortunately, there's no one tracking it. Um, so one question that came in from Natalia, which I think is a great question I'd like to take, which was, what are some of the biggest challenges cell phones and companies would face implementing or incorporating medical tourism into their benefits package? So right now, um, it would be, I would say, one, partnering with a hospital that isn't ready for medical tourists, um, doesn't really have international patient services in place. It's just because just they said they do doesn't mean that they do. Some hospitals nail it. They provide an amazing experience. Some throw a marketing person into their department and just say, you do the best that you can to treating international patients. Um, because if you're an employer, you don't want to take a chance of implementing medical tourism. If one employee has a bad experience, um, you're not going to send any more employees. And then working with a company that can actually engage and educate your employees, knows how health insurance works, knows the terms, and is going to protect the HIPAA privacy. Because I think one of the biggest potential enemies to medical tourism um, right now is um, a company going to a U.S. self-funded employer to implement medical tourism where they don't really have the infrastructure in place. They don't have the technology in place. They don't know how to educate and engage, and they're going to violate HIPAA. And, all, and what that means is once that HIPAA violation happens, they are not going to, um, they're going to cancel the medical tourism plan. They're going to tell other people, um, and it's going to really uh, hurt the industry. Um, so really, you have to have everything, I think, perfect to make it work really successfully. Um, so that's all the time we have for questions today because we're almost running out of time. Um, we are uh, going to send the slides out afterwards. Feel free to email me at john, J-O-N, at medicaltourismassociation.com. So this conference is the 27th through the 30th in Orlando in a couple weeks. The next conference is going to be around the same time in D.C. I think it's a September 25th through the 28th in Washington, D.C. And then November 14th to the 16th, we're going to be hosting our conference in Guy in China. And then we'll be announcing some other exciting conferences uh, shortly thereafter. So I really want to thank everyone for coming on to the webcast. And you have a great week. For those of you um, that will be seeing in about 10 to 11 days in Orlando, look forward to seeing you. Hope you bring your family. Uh, stay for a couple days and visit Mickey Mouse and Disney and Universal and have some fun. So thank you, everyone. Have a great week. Take care.